Boston Human Rights Museum. And it is so exciting to see an almost full Cinemark Theater tonight. Um, it's really my pleasure to welcome you here for the celebration of the opening of our newest special exhibition, The Girl in the Diary, Searching for Rivka in the Lodge Ghetto. Um, and it will be on view through December 31st. So spread the word. You're getting the, the first preview. I'd like to start by extending a very special thank you to the sponsors of this exhibition. Um, the Girl in the Diary is supported by Betty Jo and David Bell. They aren't able to be here with us tonight, but they sent a contingent of their friends to help us celebrate tonight, so thank you for being with us. And our exhibition sponsors are the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, Larry Ginsberg, Shula and Aaron Netzer, Celia and Larry Schoenbrunn, and Joanne and Charles Teichman in Elong 23. Thank you all so much. Please help me thank them for their sponsorship. And I'm also thrilled to thank our special exhibition community partners, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Lone Star, Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas's Jewish Community Relation Council, Legacy Senior Communities, Southwest Jewish Congress, and Temple Shalom. I'm so grateful for your partnership. We couldn't do these kinds of programs without you. So thank you for always being there with us. And I want to say a very special welcome to our museum board members who are here. Our board chair, Mark Silverman, is here, um, and, and many other volunteers, to our members and to our volunteers. We couldn't do what we do without each of you. So I am so grateful and hope that you are enjoying seeing a full house. It's, it's been a while since we've had a full house for our programs, but thank you for seeing us through the pandemic and for being here tonight and for all you do. And for those of you who aren't part of the cool club, <laughs> we can fix that. You know, you can, you can become a member or you can become a volunteer or you could become both. Um, we would really love that. So please drop by our membership desk afterwards if you're not a member because then you get um, first notice about events like this and unlimited options to come to the museum and bring your friends. Um, it is such a privilege to host an exhibition like The Girl in the Diary, which helps us understand the horrors Jews faced in the Lodz Ghetto during the Holocaust without losing sight of power, of the power of hope and the power of faith. Rivka was an ordinary girl <coughs> in extraordinary circumstances. We will never know who she might have become if her childhood had not been marked by prejudice and hatred and cut short. But this exhibition serves as a tribute to a life that will not be forgotten. If you're watching virtually tonight, I hope you will visit the museum soon to see this incredible exhibition and the, and the artifacts that um, have come from Poland. It's, it's very, very moving. But before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I would like to give a special welcome to Igor Alterman, the recently appointed president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas. I'd love for him to be able to welcome you all and share a few words. Igor? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Igor Alterman. I am the recently appointed president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, and I am honored to be here tonight. Uh, and excited to share that even though the Federation works and invests in over 80 agencies uh, around Dallas, uh, in Israel, and abroad, uh, tonight is the first time that I am representing the Jewish Federation, <laughs> and it's here at the uh, Dallas Holocaust Museum. Were we and the human rights. Uh, no that. comments. I, I will leave it undis <laughs> undisclosed. Undisclosed. Um, anyways, well, I'm very grateful uh, to you, Mary Pat, and the leadership and the team for extending this invitation. Thank you. Um, and you would be excited to learn that I've learned about this museum far before uh, I accepted this job, or that was even on the horizon. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, lay leaders in Miami. Uh, who happens to be a co-founder of the Miami Beach Holocaust Memorial, 
uh, was thinking about uh, expanding it into an educational facility and was looking into the best practices in the field and looked at Dallas and I believe flew into Dallas yeah. to learn uh, about it. So again, a wholehearted Mazal Tov and congratulations to the leadership and everybody involved in creating an institution that is nationally recognized and has an international impact. Um, you know, on a personal note, I'm, note I, I'm truly grateful to be here tonight. I, um, as a Jew who was born and raised in Russia, I could have easily been uh, right now, today, surrounded by this grotesque propaganda and even worse, I could have lived on the other side of the border and was uh, hiding from bombing. And um, it, it's, it's, you know, in the moment when Eastern Europe is on fire again, when people are hiding in shelters, when Jewish lives, among others, are in danger, this feels even more so important to be able to honor the memory of those whose spirits were not broken whose passion, courage, and determination we can learn from to mark this moment as a community. On behalf of the board, staff, the entire Jewish Federation, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for the honor of supporting this exhibition and partnering with the museum and educating Dallas community about the vital lessons of the Holocaust and human rights around the world. Thank you, everybody. Igor, thank you so much for being with us tonight, and welcome to the community. Um, I hope I didn't put you on the spot saying that we were the first person that you visited, but I think we were. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm also very honored to have Jakub Novikovsky, the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum and co-curator of The Girl in the Diary with us tonight. Jakob was born and raised in um, Kazimierz, the former Jewish district of Krakow, Poland. And coming from a non-Jewish family that lived in the area for generations, from an early age, he was compelled to research the history of his neighborhood. He's given presentations around the world, gaining recognition for his knowledge, passion, and unique insider's perspective on Polish-Jewish relations in contemporary Poland. And while Jakob didn't remember me, I remembered meeting him. Um, about in 2015, Michael Berenbaum, who led the exhibition design for our permanent exhibition, took a group of leaders from the Holo Dallas Holocaust Museum to visit um, the camps. And we went to your incredible museum. And for any of you that are visiting Krakow, please go see it. It's a beautiful and very special place. Um, we will leave time at the end of the program for questions. If you are, so if you're with us in person, as usual, we'll be passing out note cards. So please put your questions on the note card and we'll pick them up and get to as many of them as possible. If you're joining us virtually, um, please put your questions in the Q&A. Annie Black, our amazing director of programs, will be monitoring those questions and, and get them to me. And we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jakob Novakovsky. Uh, Jakob Novakovsky. Well, uh, certainly, uh, Marie Pat is making this a, a hotspot um, for at least some of us. Um, Dobry wieczór, dzień dobry. Um, it's a welcome. I mean, it's, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here with you today, um, not only because of the weather, uh, which, which I did not complain, it's beautiful, um, uh, but because of the exhibition. Um, uh, you know, in, in this time, as, as Igor mentioned, we're living in a, in a complicated times, as, as a, in a interesting times, you know, a time of anxiety and turmoil and COVID and the war, um, but, but being here with you guys, um, being together, opening this, this exhibition gives us perhaps a, a bit of hope that things will get better at some point. Um, and before I, I, I talk about the exhibition, I'd like to uh, extend uh, recognition uh, and thanks to the entire team of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for the work uh, uh, 
and um, this exhibition been in a few other places and we've been traveling with this exhibition, but I think working with this team was, was truly exceptional. Um, so thank you so much for, for doing that and for bringing this, this unique story to, um, to Dallas, to Texas. And well, you know, this, this exhibition, I don't, know, I don't know how many of you have a, already have a, um, had a chance to look at it, but it really is uh, um, unique uh, for at least few reasons. Uh, one of those uh, reasons is that actually this is one of those stories that have uh, at least few beginnings uh, and pretty much no end. Um, so this, this story mm, that we tell in this exhibition or the starting point for this story might be um, fall of 1943. This is where when uh, a girl in the witch ghetto, uh, Rivka, it's be, uh, is, is given a homework in the secret school. Uh, uh, the Germans were not allowing the Jewish kids to attend the schools, but nevertheless, the Jewish community would uh, create such a schools. So the kids in one of those schools are being given a homework to start writing a diary. And uh, while uh, most of Rivka's colleagues stopped writing after a few entries, uh, Rivka didn't. And she created a diary that would cover um, the time between the fall of 1940 and the spring of 1944. So perhaps this moment, the homework, uh, might be a good start for this exhibition. Or perhaps the other uh, moment in time, uh, January of 1945. Um, this is when the diary is being discovered in the ruins of crematorium in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, it's being discovered by a Russian doctor, uh, Anastasia Berezovska, who is uh, part of the Russian troops that liberated Auschwitz on January 27, 1945. January 27 is the day that we commemorate today uh, mm, precisely because of that. Um, so perhaps that could be a starting point. Uh, on the other hand, um, Anastasia, uh, she, she picks the, the diary from the ruins of the crematorium, but she doesn't read Polish. She doesn't know what, what it is. She understands that this is something important. So she um, take it, takes, uh, takes it with her. Uh, and then the diary goes from Auschwitz um, to uh, Omsk in Siberia, then to uh, Moscow uh, to arrive in San Francisco in 2008. So perhaps their arrival in San Francisco in 2008 might be uh, a beginning. Um, and we could find a few other uh, beginnings, but how about the end? Uh, and there's gonna be a first spoiler alert in my presentation. So if you wanna, if you don't want uh, uh, the exhibition to be spoiled, you can um, turn your head. Um, we don't know what happened with Rivka. Um, the, the, the exhibition leaves us with this uncertainty, with, with uh, anxiety, with hunger for knowledge uh, that we don't really have. And perhaps um, that's good, as it reminds us that uh, we still know very little about the Holocaust and we still uh, know very little about the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, the story we tells, the stories we tell, the names we remember are only a fracture of, of the world that's been mm, destroyed. Um, but there are other reasons why this story is, is, is unique. Um, you know, it's, it's important and it's unique because while there are many memora memorials, there are many uh, uh, memoirs from the time of the war, uh, most of them uh, uh, would be published after the war, or would be edited after the war. Uh, um, Rivka's diary is different. Uh, uh, she wrote her note between the fall of 1943 and the spring of 1944. Then the diary went from Łódź to Auschwitz, to uh, Omsk, to Moscow, to San Francisco, without not a single word changed. So this is a bottle thrown into the ocean of time. Uh, and we, uh, only in 2008, were able to, to read that. Um, what is uh, the another unusual and important thing about this, this story and that diary is actually uh, that it's a diary r written by a woman, by a girl. Again, most of those testimonies, most of these memoirs that we have are, comes from men, soldiers, uh, 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 policemen, uh, professors, politicians. Uh, there are those that come from women, from girls. Uh, uh, the diary of Anna Frank mm, will be, uh, of course, the most famous, uh, but uh, recently there has been uh, another uh, diary of Renia Spiegel published here in, in the United States. 
Uh, but Rivka, Rivka's experience is different. Um, mm, it's unlike uh, Anna's Frank or, or Renia Spiegel's. Uh, um, Rivka comes from a very poor, orthodox, traditional Yiddish-speaking family. Uh, unlike Anna Frank, uh, uh, who ca came from Western Europe, unlike uh, Renia Spiegel, who came from well-off, uh, assimilated family, Rivka is precisely like most of the victims of the Holocaust. So her experience, her what she saw was in many much more uh, uh, what what other victims of the Holocaust been uh, been coming from. And then uh, again, I mean, coming from this this special context of of, of Eastern Europe, of, of poor family, of Yiddish speaking family, of being Orthodox is important. And that's uh, yet another unique feature of that story. I mean, Rifla, Rivka is deeply religious. She comes from very orthodox family, um, and if you if you um, you get to the exhibition, you'll read uh, the fragments that we've selected. But there is also a multimedia table that allows you to read the entire story. You'll be surprised. You'll be taken. You'll be shocked. Uh, uh, how many times Rivka uh, express uh, her devotion to God? How deeply she feels grateful for being Jewish. I mean, this is 1943, 1944. She lost everyone and everything. She has been humiliated. A persecuted, starved, and yet, in not a single sentence, um, in not a single point, she would lose her faith. Um, and yet, there is another thing that that comes with with this religious uh, traditional up upbringing. upbringing. Um, uh, in her diary, if you get to read it, you'll see that in her vicinity, among her friends, among among her colleagues, there are no boys, there are no men. She comes from this totally 100% female circle. And of course, this is not of surprise. Again, she's orthodox, she's traditional. Um, mm, so this, uh, this, uh, this, this story, this um, diary, give us insight from this very feminine uh, uh, girl's point of view. And that's, again, something that is very, very unique. Uh, and actually, when we were creating this exhibition, uh, if you go there, you'll see that there is this table, uh, and then there are fragments of Rivka's uh, testimony, but then there are tablets with uh, explanations. And those tablets were kind of uh, um, explain what Rivka is writing about when she writes about war, about hunger, about uh, deportations. To, to explain this to the visitors, we've asked, we've collected or created a group of experts. We had uh, historians, psychologists, physicians, uh, uh, rabbis, and kind of to honor this, this very traditional uh, uh, way of living of Rivka, we've made sure, I mean, we, we've, 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 um, all those experts are, are also women. We wanted to honor and to make Rivka in this very symbolic way feel comfortable uh, in, in, this, uh, in this exhibition. Um, there are other things that are, that, are, uh, that are done differently or are worth noticing in this exhibition. Uh, I, and uh, there was also a challenge. I mean, if, if w w one of the things that we don't have uh, in, in that story is actually a photo of Rivka. Today we know quite a lot about her, but there is no known photo of Rivka Lushitz. So that's uh, a kind of, uh, is a problem when you create an exhibition about Rivka Lipschitz. Um, so in this exhibition, you'll see that, uh, that there, there are those projectors and the screens or, and the photographs uh, and we've selected photographs of the people that are anonymous. Uh, uh, we, we kind of wanted to symbolically show that perhaps on one of those photographs, Rivka uh, is, is looking at us and we can look at the Rivka. And also, if you will look at those photographs, you will see that uh, most of them are unusual. Um, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we look at the photographs from the time of the Holocaust, we need to remember that most of the photographs were taken by the Germans, were taken by the perpetrators. They are presenting the Jews in a way the Germans wanted them to see. So we see people just before being killed. We saw people without faces in, in, in shabby clothes, uh, starving to death. Uh, uh, we, look, we see the final result of the Nazi policy. Uh, but in this exhibition, you'll see a different picture. Uh, we've, we've, we've collected a, a, a collection of photographs that came from within the Wuch ghetto. The photographer that photographers that took those photographs were uh, Wuch Jews. They've been working officially for, for the Judenrat, for the Jewish Council. They had some official uh, uh, duties, but in their meantime, spare time, they risked their lives to take photographs of the daily moments, of the moments of happiness, of joy, of love, of smile, despite the, all the horrible things. 
Um, and that is something that I constantly find um, very moving in this, um, in this story. So you know, I hope that uh, at this point you already don't regret spending this time this evening with us uh, um, today and, and you, uh, you know, you're already interested. And we were very much interested when we heard about that story back in 2016. Uh, um, it was uh, Dr. Anita Friedman, um, the head of the Jewish Families and Children's Services from San Francisco and also the head of the Coret Foundation, who is one of our sponsors, uh, that um, came to Krakow in 2016 and brought an um, English publication of the diary. She came to us asking if we could help with publishing it in Polish. Well, I'm sure uh, Maripat can confirm we don't really want to disappoint our sponsors. Um, at the same time, uh, as a museum, we are not really in a, in a business of publishing books. We do catalogs, um, but not the books. So I kind of got very uh, uh, flexible and, and, and charming, and I said, well, it's a wonderful story. I'm sure it is. Uh, how about uh, I'll take a book and I'll get back to you soon enough with, with some ideas. 24 hours later, I came back to, to Mrs. Uh, Friedman saying, listen, Perhaps we're not the best place uh, or institution to, um, to publish the book, but we would uh, do whatever we can to make an exhibition out of this story because this is really, truly a unique thing. This is a gem. And we would uh, be honored if we could tell the story of Rivka to the audience in all different places. Um, so this is how it started for us. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, when we when we're looking uh, at this story, we've noticed all those unusual things that I already mentioned. But what we find also extremely interesting was also the story of research that started when the Rivka's diary arrived to San Francisco, because in 2008, the granddaughter of this Russian doctor appears at the doorstep of Jewish Families and Children's Services with a notebook uh, that no one read in 70 years. No one knows what it is all about, who's the author, where the author comes from, how did the diary ended up in, in the crematorium, in the ruins of crematorium of Auschwitz. Um, and again, this is Dr. Anita Friedman who puts together a team of researchers, of historians who, uh, who, are on, uh, who start to work on that, who are trying to search to find Rivka. And what happened later actually could be turned into a great movie with action taking place in different archives, in different places of the world and with different twists of, of the story. It took uh, almost two years uh, from 2008 to actually transcribe and translate the diary. Um, two years of, 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 of very heavy uh, work uh, which resulted with, with a name, Rivka Lipschitz. Uh, having their name, the researchers could go to archives in Łódź, in, in Israel, in the United States and confirm that this is actually true, that this is not fake, that there was a person who had uh, siblings and parents, the names Rivka gave in, in the diary. Um, but what happened with, with Rivka? Uh, having those names, uh, uh, researchers were able to find testimonies made by Rivka, uh, Rivka cousin, uh, Mina, uh, in Yad Vashem in 1955 and then again in 2000. And in this, in this testimony, uh, Rivka's cousin Mina says that uh, Rivka died in Bergen-Belsen in uh, April of 1945. Uh, you can imagine how disappointed and, and, and uh, struck uh, the team uh, in, in California is. And uh, Anita Friedman then decided to go and meet with, with those cousins. Uh, they lived in, in Tel Aviv, they live in Tel Aviv. Uh, she fly over uh, and actually in, in the exhibition you can see a footage from, from that very meeting when she is showing them uh, a diary that her cousin Rivka wrote and had no idea. They, they had no idea that, that Rivka wrote this, this diary. Um, and then they tell uh, what happened. Um, so in August uh, 1944, um, the cousins uh, with Rivka and Rivka's sister uh, are being deported from which ghetto to Auschwitz. The which ghetto is being liquidated and those that are still alive are being sent to Auschwitz. Upon arrival, one of the cousins, Hannah, is, uh, cons is being considered uh, too young to work and being sent to gas chamber. Um, but uh, the other girls are being sent further through a number of concentration and slave labor camp uh, to finally arrive 
to Bergen-Belsen. And this is where in Bergen-Belsen in April of 1945, uh, they are being liberated by the British army. Unfortunately, one of the cousins at that time uh, is, is, is uh, sick, is ill, and she dies precisely at the day of the liberation. Uh, Mina and Estera, so the two older cousins, they adopted Rivka uh, when she lost her parents. They are obviously also in, in horrible conditions, uh, but they are strong enough to be transported from the Bergen-Belsen to Sweden, to hospitals in, in Sweden. Um, but Rivka is also in a, in a horrible condition. And if you go to the exhibition, you'll see a, a, a document with a hand with note of a doctor from Bergen-Belsen uh, next to Rivka's name saying, too ill to be transported to Sweden. So Rivka dies uh, in Bergen-Belsen in April of 1945. So then mm, the historians uh, want to find the last document, the last puzzle, a death certificate that should have been produced by the Brits uh, um, already. So they go to archives in the United States, in Germany, in the United States, uh, in, in UK, looking for such evidence. And then a miracle happens. Instead of the document, um, uh, instead of the proof certificate, uh, a historian in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum comes in with a different document, dating September 10th, 1945, uh, um, confirming transfer of Rivka uh, from Bergen-Belsen to another hospital uh, on the uh, bank of the Baltic Sea in northern Germany. So Rivka didn't die in uh, April in Bergen-Belsen. So then the historians go up, go north, and are looking through archives in northern Germany, in Sweden, in Israel, once again, in all of the places. Uh, but there are no further records. Uh, desperately, they are uh, publishing and buying out adverts in the newspapers in, in northern Germany. And actually, you can see one of those articles in, in the exhibition saying, have you heard about this small hospital? Have you heard about the prisoners that came uh, in 1945? Have you heard about this girl? but there is no result. But um, there is a student, a young student uh, that uh, study in, in Germany and she learns about this story and she volunteered to help. And she goes from archive to archive and in one of those places she finds uh, a document that was overlooked. This document is, 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 a, is a list of names of the prisoners um, who were transported to this uh, hospital in this small town of Nindorf near uh, Lübeck in Germany. Uh, and there are names of the um, uh, prisoners who didn't make it, who despite being uh, treated in the hospital died. Five names. Uh, and uh, those names are important because if you look at this document from September, on that document from September there are six names. Uh, six girls, six Jewish girls that are being taken from Bergen, Belsen to this, uh, this place. Five of them died, didn't make it, and actually are buried in the Jewish cemetery in the city of Lübeck. Rivka's name is not there. So, again, there were a number of research uh, going on, a number of, of adverts, commercials being, being uh, mm, published in Israel, Germany, but with no result. So this is when the question mark uh, stays. We don't know what happened to Rivka. Perhaps uh, like the five other girls, uh, she died, uh, but there was some mistake in, 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 in documents and she was buried under a different name. Or perhaps um, perhaps she got married and left the, the hospital with, with a different name. Or perhaps, yes, and that's something that we very much want to believe, one day she'll come out from the shadows and she will say, here I am, uh, I survived, um, I have kids of my own, and I have grandkids of my own, and, and all the members of the family that didn't make it are um, live in our memory. Um, but if not, but if that uh, will never uh, be a case, perhaps this is precisely the one thing that we can do for her. Uh, we can remember, we can remember her name, and the names of, uh, of her family. And if you go through the exhibition, you will see that actually the, the last part, the last, uh, one of the last um, pieces is, is, is devoted to those people, her siblings and cousins who didn't make it. 
to her brother, Abramek, who was born on January 13th of 1932, <coughs> was killed in the gas chamber of Helmno death camp at the age of 10. To her cousin, Tsipak Tsipka, uh, who was born in October 9, uh, 1933, who was killed in Auschwitz at the age of 11. To her sister, who was born on September 10, 1937, who was killed uh, in the gas chambers of Helmno at the age of five. And finally, yes, to Rivka Lipschitz, uh, daughter of Jankiel and Miriam, uh, who was born on September 15, 1929. None of those names, none of those names would be spoken uh, if not for Rivka and her diary. Uh, none of those names would be spoken if not for a number of people. I mean, there's this unusual, amazing chain of people who were in the right time, in the right place, and did the right thing. Um, and without them, we wouldn't be here. Um, so that's the doctor that, that uh, picked up the diary, Anastasia Berezovska, her granddaughter who brought the diary to California, Zinaida, uh, the historians, the researchers, Judy Janiec, Eva Wiatr, Anita Friedman. Um, at the same time, none of those names would be spoken uh, here if not for the wonderful team of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Um, I don't know if it's Sounds that I should finish. Uh, it's a phone number if people like that hear okay. All right. So again, I mean, this is something that is, is if, if you ask me what it is that I take from this exhibition, it's precisely that what we do matters. Uh, what we do can change the world in a sense. So again, there is this incredibly long chain of people that ends here with, with Maripat Higgins, with, with Sarah Abosh, with uh, Annie Black, with the entire team of, of the Holocaust Museum, uh, w thanks to whom uh, we can be here to get today and hear about those names. And for that, I would like to extend my thanks uh, to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Please feel free to write your questions on a note card and our staff will be coming by to pick them up. So Jakob, we'll start. I have a couple of questions to start with. Did you and your team have any concerns about building an exhibit without a clear ending? Or was that an exciting part of the process? Yes, both. <laughs> um, it, was, it was really exciting to, to find, to look at this, this story. Um, and, and I mean, there were many challenges, many challenges, uh, end of, I mean, lack of ending is one of them, lack of photo of, of Rivka is another one, uh, but also actually the, the difficult, the most difficult part of, of putting together this exhibition was to select those fragments that ended up in the exhibition. I mean, the diary is, is, is covering uh, eight or 10 months, there are uh, 100, 100, whatever, 20 pages. Uh, and obviously we couldn't um, put them all. So, so the, the moment that, the, the, I mean, what took us the longest when we were working on this exhibition was precisely to select only those fragments that will end in being presented in the exhibition. But again, I mean, there was a book, you can, you can I mean, it's difficult now today to, to buy it, you can, uh, but you can, there's also a multimedia table as a part of the exhibition when the entire diary is, is, is reproduced. Um, I believe we have the book in, the, in our museum store. Wonderful. We will soon, it's not here. <laughs> Let us know if you want to place your order. But, so it, do you have a personal favorite part of the diary? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I mean, again, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking to read the diary. Uh, I mean, and there are lots of parts. Uh, what, what you may find interesting is that despite uh, coming from this, this orthodox traditional family, uh, Rivka's mother tongue would be Yiddish, um, she would write the diary in Polish. And there's a fragment uh, where actually she, she says that it's, it's funny, I'm looking at myself, a Jewish girl in the ghetto writing this, this diary in, in Polish. Uh, there are other things, I mean, this devotion to God. Uh, if you think about this, it's, it's you know, spring of 1944, everyone is already 
uh, from her family is, 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 is dead. And yet she is thanking God for being uh, with her, for she says that she's proud to be Jewish, uh, she's thankful for his presence. Um, but actually my, uh, the, the part that I find most moving is, is, is somewhere else. I mean, this is also spring of 1944, this is toward the end of the diary. And uh, one of the teachers in the secret school asked the kids to write how it will look when they will arrive to Palestine. Oh. Again, this is spring of 1944. And you know, t kids are responding. Rivka, there's multiple entries from Rivka where she, 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 you know, for her it's a serious, real question. So she writes that it's gonna be very complicated, difficult for her because she will be far away from the graves of her parents. And the other entry, she wonders what if her brother uh, will come, uh, whether, she will, uh, whether he will find her in Palestine. And actually if you go to the archive in Łódź, uh, uh, you will find the responses of other children to the same task. And some of them wrote uh, 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 extremely heartbreaking uh, pictures of kids arriving to the beaches of, of Palestine and there are camels and palms and sun uh, and, and in the back you see the barber wires. I think you know, for the teacher to ask this question, uh, for the, the, those, those kids to grasp this and to respond in such a powerful and serious way is, is, is absolutely amazing. Do you think Rivka left her diary at Auschwitz on purpose or because she could no longer bring it with her? Have any, any I thoughts? absolutely no, have no idea. I mean, uh, the fact that she took it with her uh, it shows that it was clearly extremely important mm -hmm. for her. Uh, there were only a handful of things she could have uh, taken with her from Łódź when they were deported. Uh, a diary is not the obvious uh, choice. Right. Um, I have no idea what happened, uh, why it was left. Um, perhaps she left it behind as a, as a, again, as a, this, this bottle uh, uh, she threw into the ocean, hoping that this will remain, that someone will find it. Can you tell us why it took so long for the diary to be discovered, why it was hidden? Well, I mean, it's it's we say we, 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 we say that it was discovered, but actually uh, it's true for most of those things that still are surfacing, the diaries, uh, the, 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 the pictures, um, they are often being kept by the families. Uh, who knows, that knows about them. They know that this is something that belonged to their grandmother or to the Jews that been living in this place. Uh, but for many, many years, they wouldn't consider those of, uh, to be of importance. They, th those people that kept those things, they were important for them. I mean, the f again, the fact that the diary was passed on from generation to generation, the family, this Russian family was moving from Osk Omsk and Siberia to Moscow and so on, it was always moved with them. Mm. So it was clearly important for them, but they just wouldn't think that this, is, this would be of any importance for anybody else. Um, and, and it was until 2008 when, when, when uh, the granddaughter Zinaida thought that it may, maybe, maybe she will, it's worth of showing to someone um, in, in the United States. And actually we've been, we, when we've been working on this exhibition, we've contacted people from the United States Holocaust Memorial who actually are helping with this exhibition. Some of the obje objects for this show came from them. And they have an email Zinaida sent to them back in 2008 saying I have this, this, this diary, maybe you find it important. And our colleague, and he regrets this, uh, this uh, response to, to this day, said, wonderful, how about you post it to us? Uh. And she said, post it? <laughs> Never. Nah. Uh, and then yes, she would come to study in the United States, in California, and she showed it to, to the people at the, at the Jewish Families uh, Center. So you talked about the hidden stories that families hang on to. And there's a question of you know, how many other stories like that of Rivka's are currently out there and under research. Do you know of any other? Yes, yes. I mean, there, 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 is, there is quite a lot of those things still uh, coming out, especially now the Holocaust survivors are, are, are passing away. Uh, but also the, the witnesses of the Holocaust are in the same way uh, are disappearing and, and now they are sometimes take, taking those things out of uh, from under the bed, from, from the closets. They are 
uh, speaking because they it's always been important for them so at the Galicia Jewish Museum we've done we've done actually three exhibitions which which were precisely the same situation I mean one of those exhibitions was actually uh, uh, of the photographs that were taken by a Krakowian Jew, Zef Aleksandrovich. He was coming from a quite uh, uh, wealthy family. Um, he would travel throughout the world in 1930s, so he was in Buffalo. I don't know whether he was in Texas, but he was in Buffalo. Uh, mm, he was in Japan and all different places. And then he settled in, in Palestine. This is pre-war. Pre he got married, and you know, the family of, 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 uh, of his wife said, grow up. You need to do business. You need to start making, you know, uh, a, be, be an adult. Um, taking photographs is not something we want you to do. And uh, so he stopped. He um, he put his collection uh, and the two suitcases and he stored them at the attic of his house. And uh, in early 2000s, so 60 years later, 70 years later, his grandson discovered a collection of 20,000 negatives. 20,000 negatives that have wow. been there this entire time. And we've done a number of exhibitions out of this, and this exhibition's been done in, in other places now, but we were the first. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and there was other exhibitions that, that, I mean, people brought things that they didn't consider to be important. Um, and I think that's one of the, you know, one of the things that this exhibition should do. Those things are of extreme importance. We should be we should be speaking about them. We should be uh, protecting them. We should be showing them to the experts uh, because they are of great importance. What can you tell us about Rivka's personality from her diary? Well, um, she was stubborn. <laughs> she could be mean. Um, her relation with how her old was Rivka? She was in 1929. She was born in 1929. Um, you know, the, she's the, the a teenage girl. She is. She's very much a teenage girl. And I think what you find in, in this diary is not what you expect to find. I mean, the diary is not about suffering. The diary is not about pain. Th th there is there are the suffering and pain and hunger and starvation and fear and tears are there. But it's also joy. It's also a, a daily life. You know, uh, there is a moment when she complains that there, there was a dress that she got a couple of months ago and it's, uh, she's so, so thin that it's too big. Or she, she complains that she wrote a poem and that poem was selected by her teacher to be read out loud on some occasion, but actually the teacher uh, picked another student to read it. And actually, yeah, that's, I mean, the only place where she write, life sucks. <laughs> She was a teenage girl, right? <laughs> yes, yes. So, so I mean, th th those are those wow. things that you know that 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 that, that uh, you can find. And of course, she writes that it's winter, and they 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 are being sent, they are being given a, a, a bag of, of coal, which which is like 240 pounds, and she and her sister has to carry it to home. And and I mean, she writes about how difficult and painful it is, um, but then. She writes, my diary, don't you worry, I done it. Um, so, so, so I think she was, she was very optimistic and perhaps this was precisely her faith in God that kept her going despite all those horrible, uh, horrible things. Um, I think she was special, yeah. You spoke about her cousin who lives in Tel Aviv. Does she have, are you aware of other family members who survived? No. No, as far as we know, um, two cousins survived. They were the ones that um, when, when Rivka's parents died, uh, it was already after the war uh, broke out. Um, she, because she was underage, she had to be adopted by someone from the family who was uh, over 18. So they became her legal guardians. Um, and if you read about, if, when you read the diary, you'll find that Rivka is very, um, is very tough on those cousins. She, she writes that they, uh, not allowed her to write uh, and they ta take the candle from her. Uh, well, pr probably they do it because the candle is, is expensive and they want her to go to sleep instead of just, just, just writing. Um, but no, we, we, we are not aware of any cousins, any other members of the family. The entire family was killed. 
so Jakob, this question is about you personally. Okay. Says, I, I would like to hear your story. How did you come to research this when your background is not Jewish? Um, well, yes, uh, it's, it's not as exciting uh, at all. Um, I, I was born in, as, 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 as you heard, uh, in, in this particular part of Krakow, which is Kazimierz, that was a Jewish district. So if you've been there, you've seen that there are six synagogues, the oldest one in Poland from uh, the end of 15th century. Uh, but there were always non-Jewish minority living in this, in this town. Uh, and, uh, and my family been there for uh, at least 200 years, precisely as a non-Jewish minority in the Jewish town. The thing is that when I was uh, brought up in the 80s and early 90s, I had no idea about that past. Mm. Um, that would be something that my parents would consider not to be of importance. What we've been, and they've been taught, and we've been taught was to exclude the synagogues, the cemeteries, the Jewish part of the story from the, the landscape that we, we consider to be ours. And yet, um, it was later on that I discovered that because of this proximity of our experience, as of my family and the Jewish neighbors, a uh, big part of who uh, am I actually came from their Jewish neighbors. So to give you an example, um, until now, Actually, and, and, and my mom mm, calls a, a stove, a kitchen, a, a, an oven in the kitchen. The word she used to, to describe it is a Shabbashnik, Shabbos oven. Oh. Uh, she's not Jewish, mm. but she, the family lived so long, so close to the Jews that that was absorbed. And again, I mean, until I was a teenager, I was certain that Shabbashnik, Shabbos oven, is a proper word for a stove. Uh, and there were many other things um, like this that uh, you know only later on made uh, uh, made sense that these are the things that were left behind. The people were gone, but they left behind things, language, cuisine, uh, uh, um, and we 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 took it, we took it over, and we used. Um, and only now we actually understand where so many of those things are coming from. So that was kind of where it started, to discover that a big part of my DNA, uh, 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 cultural DNA, comes from other people. I mean, this is as if at some point you would uh, you'd be, you'd be surprised to learn that Chicago or Milwaukee are actually not the proper English uh, names uh, or you know, come, doesn't come from uh, English language. Um, all of this was erased from, from uh, the debates or discussions we would have. Can you tell us more about your museum? Thank you, yes. Um, well, the Galicia Jewish Museum uh, is a peculiar place um, because in a sense we're we are not a Holocaust memorial, we are not historical museum, uh, we are far more or far closer to the contemporary Jewish museum. In a sense that what is interesting, uh, the past is interesting in a sense or in a way that it shapes the present day. This is precisely how we've, what, how we've done this exhibition. We could have done it only looking at the Rivka story, but what was important for us is also uh, uh, what happened later, the research, the, the efforts that have been done by countless of people that made, uh, um, that made this story uh, uh, public. Um, so, so, so yes, the past is interesting, but what we're looking at, is, what we are looking at is precisely how the past is shaping present day Polish Jewish experience. The Polish Jewish relations. You know, um, Poland is complicated because you will not find any other place anywhere in the world where, where the, you will find so many places of Jewish life standing so close to so many traces of Jewish death. Mm. If you go back to back of to you know, if we move in time to the end of 18th century, this is the moment in approximately 75 percent of all the Jews of the world living in Poland. This is where Poland is the center of the Jewishness. And then 200 years later, Poland is becoming a ground zero of the Holocaust. Most of the victims of the Holocaust are killed in Eastern Europe in Poland. Uh, and then, I mean, those two stories of the Jewish life and Jewish presence, then there's a story of Jewish, of, of oblivion. I mean, none of this is being discussed. Uh, and then the last 30 years is a story of, of, of revival of Jewish life and, and, and growing interest of the non-Jews like myself in, in, in Jewish history, culture, and the Holocaust. 
So what is uh, what we're looking at in our in our um, museum is precisely those four stories. If there is one thing we want our visitors to understand or to remember after leaving the museum, it's simple: that Poland is complicated. Uh, that should you wish to come and follow the story of death and destruction and anti-Semitism, it's all there. You don't even need to go to Auschwitz. If you want to come and see about the diversity and the glory and the richness of the Jewish civilization, it's all there. The synagogues, the cemeteries, uh, 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 the language, the cuisine, the music, this will be a proof of the diversity and, and vitality of the Jewish world. Um, and this is what, uh, what our museum is all about, about this compli complicated experience uh, of, 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 the, of the Polish Jews throughout the history. Have you had any pressure from the government to yeah, change, change your... <laughs> change of the tempo. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. To you know. suppress stories, and, right? Um, yeah, you know that, that Poland has... Uh, we were, uh, we're having a right-wing government in Poland that is, is very... Uh, focused on, on, on the Holocaust and how the Holocaust is being told. Uh, the Galicia Jewish Museum, well, fortunately, we are, not, we are an NGO. We are a non-governmental organization. We are a charity foundation. So the Ministry of Culture uh, doesn't have a red button that would uh, um, send me um, somewhere else. <laughs> um, um, and that's good. And that makes our, that, that makes, um, uh, our life uh, easier. Um, so no, we, we haven't had uh, direct uh, uh, pressure from the government. But yes, we, we've seen that there is a pressure from the government in the sense that government uh, wants to organizations and schools and teachers uh, um, to focus more on the story of Polish heroism. Uh, instead of talking about Polish, uh, how complicated the Polish Jewish experience or Catholic Jewish experience was during the war. So there were those that were trying to help, but there were also those that participated in the persecution and mass killing of the Jews. So the government doesn't really want us to talk about that. They want to talk more only about one fragment of the story. And uh, why we haven't had any direct um, pressure from the government is not to say that there were no other institutions that would have a direct pressure from, from the government uh, trying to stop them from, from what they do, uh, changing their directorship and so on. Right. Pauline. Pauline right. Museum, In yes, Warsaw, that's, that's a good example, yes. So another personal question. How has your journey changed your heart? This is a Texas question here. Um, will you continue your publishing of similar children's views of the Holocaust? Yes, yes. I think that, um, I mean, on top of everything, uh, you know, if you ask what, this, what does this exhibition do, it, it does a lot of things. It teaches about the Holocaust. It, 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 it promotes tolerance and, and so on and so on. But on, on, on some level, I think that, the, yes, with all, everything that we do here, with every celebration, with every anniversary, the sad reality is that it's all too late. That it's always 70 years too late. Um, and there's nothing we can do about that. So what was important for us, for me, and, and uh, our world, is precisely this moment when we can bring one name from oblivion. And we can bring that person even for a while, even for a moment, back to life in what we do. I think this is, again, the, the, the last, the least, the, the, the small thing that we can do for those people, but also for us. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think this is, this is important, whether it's story of children or, or adults. Um, how does it change me? I don't know. Uh, I think it's, 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 um, it's a very moving field of work and I'm sure Mary mm -hmm. Pat and, 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 and her team can, can say that it's far more than just you know uh, starting at nine and ending at, at, at five. Um, this really is very moving um, and I think you know after I have two boys at home uh, one is five and one, one is seven and after I had them it became extremely difficult for me to read those stories especially of the suffering of the children. Um, something changed, yes, at that moment when I saw how innocent, how fragile um, those, those kids are. So yes, there are things that are changing, I'm sure all of us, when we, when we focus, when we learn, when we teach about those things. Um, okay, last question. 
What do you think is the most important lesson we can take from this exhibit? That what we do matters. I mean, if you ask any of those people that were somewhere on the line between January of 1945 and uh, July 14th, 2022, if you pick the one of them and say and ask, is what you've done important? Probably she or he would say, not really. I just did a small part. I just found one document. But this really matters. Um, and you can change this 180%. And you can look at those people that have been involved in the Holocaust. And if you pick one of them, a clerk, somewhere in, 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 uh, in the transit system, were running a trains, if, he, if you ask him whether he, what you've done was important, he would say, no, I was just doing my job. It wasn't important at all. Things that we do matters. And I think that is something that we should convey to everybody through this exhibition, through other exhibitions, uh, through our work, uh, that we really can change the world. But it sometimes it just doesn't look uh, as big as it can be. Wonderful message, Jakob. Thank you so much for traveling from Poland to be here with us. It's a pleasure. Thank what you. A, Thank what you. a gift. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Please be sure and go through the exhibition and tell your friends and come back and visit soon. Thank you.